Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back to class. It's been a super long break, uh, disrupted by this uh, virus, but we shall overcome. Amen. So, um, we are now at Matthew chapter 4. I trust that you have heard and listened to uh, Matthew chapter 3, which was done in my home studio. Now we are at Matthew chapter 4, but before we proceed, um, just a quick recap. The five sections that the book of Matthew is divided into are the King Revealed, chapters 1 to 10, the King Resisted, 11 to 13, the King Retreated, 14 to 20, the King Rejected, 21 to 28, and then the King Resurrected, chapter 20. Now, if we break it down a bit more, just looking at the first section, chapters 1 to 10, where King Jesus was revealed to the people of Israel, you have the person revealed, chapters 1 to 4, which will conclude today, this part of section 1. The person revealed, then we move on to the Sermon on the Mount where the principles are recorded. And then the power released and then the people were sent in the rest of the chapters. So, Father, we just want to thank you for your faithfulness. We want to thank you for your grace and for your mercy, for being our shield, for keeping us well and safe even from this coronavirus that we are here gathered in your presence, thirsting and hungry, and being hungry for more of your word, more of your revelation, that we might find application. Lord, we pray for those who are unwell, we pray for those who are not here with us. We pray, dear Lord, that your healing grace be upon them, that you, in your intervention, will arrest this prayer this virus. In fact, Lord, we pray that you will destroy this virus for your glory. So we commit this morning to you. Speak to us, teach us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you remember chapter 3, that was when our Lord Jesus was water baptized. And if you remember, uh, I ended that part by stating the reasons why Jesus wished to be baptized. Because that was the same question John the Baptist asked Jesus, sort of, you should be baptizing me instead of me baptizing you. But Jesus said, let it be so that all righteousness be fulfilled. Now, he is sinless, of course, without, without a doubt. But he wanted to affirm John's ministry. Because if I say you are a great preacher, you are a great teacher and so on, but I've never come to attend any of your sessions in the class, my word is actually quite weightless, no weight. But if my mentor comes and sits in my class and then as I teach and so on, you know he is endorsing my ministry. You follow me, yeah. If you say you are the, you 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 are my totai, you are my disciple, you are the greatest chef. You know, wow, the the world has uh, seen in the last ten years and so on. And I'm your teacher. I I taught you every skill in the kitchen, but I never tasted any of your food. How can I say uh, actually my mentor, chef, endorse what I do? I must come to your restaurant, I must sit there and eat your food. Nah. That's it, oh, and dos. Okay? So, to affirm John's ministry and to identify with us, Jesus said he came for the well or the unwell. The unwell. He did not come for the righteous, he came for those who are sinners. So, by coming into the water like a sinner would, he identified with us. God the Son, I mean, the Son of God identified with us, the sons of men. Okay? 
So, and to submit publicly, not privately, but publicly, that everyone can see. It's an outward declaration of an inward faith. And that, and when he came out of the water, the Father said, from heaven, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And you don't want to get anything else. That is the best thing if you are the Son of God. And God said, you are my beloved son or daughter in whom I am well pleased. And Jesus had not even started his ministry. And yet God accepted him as he is. So God accepts you and I as we are. We don't need the works to prove. But the works is just the result of our faith in him. Following our faith, it must be translated into service and that's where uh, we are coming to but before that before Jesus started his ministry after the water baptism he was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness I have a map for you now if you look at this map now, Jesus was, this is the Sea of Galilee, this is the Dead Sea, this is River Jordan. Now, where exactly was Jesus baptized? We are not sure, there is no, we do not know. Some say it's here, so, so they put up something and tourists will come and some is, you know, uh, possibly around this area. Anyway, this is the, the place where the last two trips when I brought our pilgrims there from BC, we baptized the people there. And then, here is Jericho. Now, Jericho was the place every tour guide will bring you. And in Jericho, there is this Mount of Temptation. And on this Mount of Temptation, you, this is temptation, when Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness and he was tempted by the devil. So, there is supposed to be the place where our Lord Jesus was tempted. And you see, between here and here, it is really wilderness. Remember when we come down from Galilee into Jerusalem, the bus ride is very long. And then you see on the left, on the right, it's more or less wilderness. So, of course, today, some of the places have been de developed, but in the days past, it was wilderness. So, after his baptism, we read verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. To be tempted by the devil. They say, wow, God tempts us. In the original meaning, it means test. And our faith ought to be tested, and God will. Our faith ought to be tested to be strengthened. You understand? If you say, you can drive, you can drive, you can drive. But if you are not tested, how do we know you can drive? When you hit another car or not? You need to be tested. We can go through, you know, secondary four, just study, 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 and they say, eh? Hey, I have learned much. But if I don't put you through the test, how do I know if you have learned the subject? The only course uh, that has no test, no exam, no homework uh, is this course. <laughs> <laughs> but I trust, okay, I trust that uh, you were diligently like the variance go and seek the word and study. So, tested. But Jesus was led up by the Spirit. And as Jesus, the Son of God, was led by the Holy Spirit, so must we. He could have come up from the water of baptism and then go and do his own thing. But he allowed himself to be led. He said, no, no, why go wilderness? You then go back to uh, the Sea of Galilee, go back to Capernaum, go back up north, cooler. I go to the wilderness. And so our walk, we must also be led by the Holy Spirit. So you look at Galatians chapter 5. 
verse 16. And Paul wrote, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts after the Spirit, and the Spirit again, no, for the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. We, likewise, since we are not under the law, then we ought to and we must be led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted or tested by the devil. And if you look at Galatians, no, James chapter 1 verse 3. My brethren, James wrote, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And then the next verse is about wisdom. So patience takes time and it will complete the work in you, whatever God is testing you and wanting you to pass. He takes you through. So it, even you take exam, the test is like one hour, two hours, right? So there is a period. So let it complete the perfect work in you. Be patient. So, And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, is it an easy endeavor? No. How many of you fast regularly? I can see. <laughs> um, one week? Three days? I fast every day. Eight hours. Between dinner and breakfast. That's why it's called breakfast, right? Breakfast. Um, it's not usual. A usual routine for most of us. So it is an occasion where you decide to shift from the physical to the spiritual. You follow me? You, you just want to focus now on the things of God. And so you want to deny yourself of all these physical needs. And that was the first thing Jesus did after he was water baptized, before he commenced his ministry. And, and, he, and after the blessing, when God the Father said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, the blessing comes the battle. And some people do face that. After the water baptism, they come, then they get hit with uh, opposition from family members and others. Why you go for water baptism, this and that. And they try serving and they get lots of problems. And they leave the church. And they leave the fellowship. Sad. After the blessing comes the battle. Expect it because you are now an enemy of the devil. So we must overcome. And we see how Jesus overcome in this record for us which you are most familiar with the three temptations but there are some lessons to learn and medical science say that uh, the human limit for fasting beyond that you get permanent damage your, your health is really your life is at, at risk it's about 40 days it is about 40 days beyond that it is really no go and Jesus did 40 days. Was he the only one who did 40 days? Moses. Moses, when he went up there, I think it's uh, Exodus 34, 28. Exodus 34, 28. So when he was there with the Lord Moses, where? Up in, up in Mount Sinai. 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water. And God, God, and he wrote on the tablets of the, the words of the covenant, the ten 
commandments. There was another notable character in the Bible who also fasted 40 days. Who is he? Who is he? Elijah. 1 Kings 19 verse 8. Elijah escapes from Jezebel. And which, which verse? Verse 8, 19 verse 8. Okay, so he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. So he ate and he drank, then he left. And in the strength of the food means whatever he ate and he drank, that sustained him, lasted him for 40 days and 40 nights when he went into the mountain of God, Horeb. So, if there be occasions where you want to seek the Lord, fasting is one. And afterward, he was hungry. Of course, it is a physical need. After you are, have not been feeding the body, you are hungry. And so the devil knows. If you're hungry, you're looking for food. And so the devil comes along and tested God's provision. Now, when the tempter, whom we know as Satan, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. And you know the devil, Satan, is very fond of hitting you below the belt. Is very fond of hitting you at your weakest point, at your weakest moment. When you are down, he steps on you. And when you are hungry, he comes with the chai tau kuei. You know, he comes with the, <laughs> this. And he said, if you are the son of God, in my Bible, I underline the word if. Is it something new that we have come across? No. Even back in Genesis, back in Genesis, the devil cast doubt upon who Eve, right? Did God really say? And that's what the devil seeks to do, put doubt in your mind. Did God really say? And now, if you are the son... But you backtrack to chapter 3, verse 17. You backtrack to chapter 3. Just look up or with your, with your last page, your Bible. Chapter 3, verse 16, verse 17. And what did God say? This is my beloved son. And then here comes the devil putting down. If you are the son of God. You, you see what the devil is trying to do? God painted white, and the devil said, is it really white? Yeah, it could be black. If you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. And God knows, I mean the devil knows, Satan knows, that for Jesus, it is not a problem. He can just do it. And he just wanted Jesus' loyalty to be switched to him. God actually is not the devil testing. It's not the devil testing Jesus. It is God testing Jesus' loyalty. Would Jesus just give in to the physical needs and ignore the leading and the direction of God, God's will? But God, of course, expects Jesus to pass. And Jesus passed. So, if you are the son of God, command this stone, that these stones become bread. So, this first thing we learn it is the last of the flesh. You know, the, the, the sins of this world uh, was so nicely put together by Apostle John. If you look at 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. 1 John chapter 2. 
15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And then in verse 16, for all that is in the world, what are they? In this world, this the, 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 the devil, the Satan is the prince of this world. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And you will see these three being overcome. Why? Because they are not of the Father, but is of the world. And in this chapter 4, we are going to look at how Jesus, number one, overcome the lust of the flesh. Because stomach is hungry, stomach is flesh. And the devil wanted to question God's provision. To question God's provision. Verse 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And this is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3. We don't need to turn there uh, because it is here. The reference is Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3, but it is here. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So the issue here is not material. The issue here is not material. It's not physical food, but spiritual food. Because that comes from the mouth of God. That is the word of God. And here, first we know very clearly that Jesus quoted the scripture. So, lesson for us, when faced with temptation, when you are tested, you must know the word. And you overcome by the word. So you quote the word. And Jesus quoted the word. He submitted himself to the word of God. Because the word of God is, has got a certain ability. So you look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So don't go and take your kitchen butcher knife and then slash the devil. You can't. It is of no effect. But the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit, will fight, will put down the enemy. Now, we also want to look at Job chapter 23. Where is Job? Job chapter 23 and uh, verse 4. You know, Job, the one who suffers so much, so much, told to curse his wife and die, he did not. And in chapter 23, verse 12, he said, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips, from God's lips, that means God's words. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. So in other words, physical food is not as important as the commandment of God's lips, the word of God, I have treasured them in my mouth. In my mouth, it is always at the ready. When necessary, I will release from my mouth more than my necessary food. Yeah, we need three meals a day. Some need more. So, key word here is obedience. Obedience to Deuteronomy chapter eight verse three. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So, round one. Who won? Jesus. God will won. Okay? God won. Because the one being tested was Jesus. God won. Round one. God's provision cannot be questioned. So, we go on to the next test. Then the devil took him up into the holy city 
Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple. So, where is the holy city? Where is the holy city? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Jericho, Jerusalem. Now, it, was it physical? Because physically it's going to take a day or so. It is probably a translation in the spirit. But it was what it meant to be. So even if they travel spiritually and so on, it was meant at this pinnacle, means at a high point. So then the devil took him into the holy city. As if the devil need an usher. I mean, as if Jesus needs an usher. No need, right? But it's just to point out to us that it is a high point. And set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And you know, Jerusalem is already on high elevation, high ground. That's why they go up to Jerusalem. And then the temple uh, was built on Mount Moriah. It is already on elevation. And then the tip of the top of the temple, the pinnacle, is really high ground, high point. And said to him, again, if, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. Throw. See whether you are Superman or not. Throw yourself down. And the devil knows the scripture. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you, you dash your foot against a stone. If you were with me at the Hokkien service or at the Mandarin service or last Sunday, I went through Psalms 91, right? I went through Psalm 91. Yeah? And Psalm 91, uh, it's where this is taken from. So you look at Psalm 91. Uh, this is verse 1. Let me see. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Is it the same? Or something is missing? For he shall give his angels charge over you. It is here, Matthew chapter 4. Then the next night, to keep you in all your ways. Missing. Skip one line, and the devil went to the next one. In their hands, they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a soul. So, the devils like to pick and choose. And some preachers do likewise. They pull a, a verse here, they pull a verse there, and then they preach it or they teach it to their convenience. That's why it is important when I preach and so I always give you the background. I always give you the context so you know why is that there. Instead of just pulling the scripture away. Now, uh, at the end of the Bible in Revelation, Jesus also said, if you add to this word, then the cursing will be added upon you. If you take away anything from this word, the Blessings will be taken away from you. So you cannot add or subtract. But that's what the devil did. So we look at this context. Now this context, Psalm 91, is the psalmist seeking refuge in the, in the God whom he worshipped in El Shaddai, in Elohim, that he will protect him and shield him on the condition that he is in the Lord and he knows the Lord's name. All in Psalm 91. And even in, in verse 9, Psalm 91, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, you have made the Lord your dwelling place. That means you are dwelling in the Lord. You are in God. You follow me? Your address is in God. You have made God your dwelling place. Then 
If you do verse 9, then verse 10, 11 onwards will be yours. So verse 10, no evil will befall you, no plague shall come near you. Uh, verse 11, for he shall give his angels charge over you. For what? Means his angels will watch over you. To keep you in all your ways. Means to watch over you in all your ways. So your ways, uh, are they good ways or bad ways? Means to watch over you as you go about doing good or doing bad. Doing good. So as you go about doing good, there will be enemies, there will be opposition. But the angels will watch over you. Not to watch over you as you do bad. And then this God is a bit uh, funny, you know. I do bad also, He wants to watch over me. To make sure I can do better, you know what I mean. Do best in my bad deeds. No. To watch over you, to keep you in all your righteous ways. To keep you in all, because it's not easy in this fallen world to remain righteous, but to keep you. So, definitely, it is not to keep you to tempt or challenge God. It is not to keep you and watch over you so you can challenge and question God's protection. You follow me? So that's why the devil removed that part. And then you read, oh, okay, he will give charge. So if you take a dive, the angels will catch you. But the angels will watch over you when you are doing the will of God to keep you in all your ways. Not to keep you so that you can challenge God to do the opposite things to God's will. Mean by ma? Okay, good. So that's why this was omitted by the devil. So the first test was the last of the flesh. Food, food, food. So right now, bring you to the highest point and ask you to take a dive and don't worry, the angels will catch you. This is what? Testing the pride of life. Wow. Yeah. God said he will catch me. Huh? So you see, I'm right at the top of the world. So let me take a dive. I will be rescued. That is the pride of life. And Jesus overcame this again with the word of God. So while the devil misused scripture by quoting incompletely, Jesus quote to him the exact scripture. Verse 7, Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. You shall not test the Lord your God. And this is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. Earlier, the other, the previous was Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. You shall not live by bread alone. This, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. It's Deuteronomy 6, 16. So that is the second test. Round 2. Round 2. Lost again. The devil lost. God won. Now we go to round 3. Verse 8. You're with me, huh? Mm -hmm. Last of the eye, pride of life. Now we go to the... No, last of the flesh, pride of life. And now we go to the last of the eye. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain. Exact mountain? Don't know. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. It's like, I bring you to Poheng Juri, you see. Oh, sparkling. Wow. You got to wear sunglasses. Oh, wow. Show him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. So this is again focusing on material, on riches, on power, and not God's glory, but what the world glorifies in. Show you all the things that the world has to offer. This is what to tempt you. Yeah, I want my Rolex watch. You know? I want my Marsili bag. You know? and, and I, I want all the, the rich things that the world has to offer. And the devil said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. All these things. And the devil is the prince of the world. He, he owns, he has possession of all this. 
and he said, I can give to you if you were what? Fall down and worship me. You know what the devil in essence was trying to do? Tell Jesus, hey, I got a shortcut for you. Skip the cross. Straight away I give all this to you. You just bow down and worship me. But Jesus, his food is to do the will of the Father. And he knew, for God sent him to the world to die for our sins so that we can be reconciled back to God. And that is the blessing. And all the kingdom of God, the children of God will be with him. But this devil comes and says, I'll give you a shortcut. No need to go to the cross. Just bow down, worship me. All this I give to you. As I mentioned on Sunday, uh, no cross, no, no crown without the cross. If you want the crown, you must have the cross. You must carry the cross. And Jesus did. So, verse 10, Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan! For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and Him only you shall serve. And this is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 13 and Deuteronomy 10 verse 20. This is very clear. Every Jew will know. You shall worship the Lord your God and Him only shall you serve. And they come together, not just worshipping, but worship and serve. That's what, that's all. In short, Jesus is affirming his allegiance to God, and there is one and one only, not the devil, not worship the devil. And if you look at uh, verse 11, then the devil left him. And behold, angels came and ministered to him. Wow, finally. Round three. Won again. The devil lost. So the devil left Jesus. And so, Jesus overcame the last of the flesh, the pride of life, and the last of the eyes. And the same thing was summarized for us in 1st John chapter 2 verse 15 and 16 when Apostle John wrote all this that means it is also likewise for us if Jesus overcame that means we can also overcome not by our own effort but in Christ we can likewise overcome but I like to highlight this then the devil left him wow the devil gave up with him, not going to bother him again. Is that true? No. If you look at Luke chapter 4, verse 13. Luke chapter 4, verse 13. And Luke was a doctor. He was very careful in his research and in his documentation. And verse 13. Now when the devil had ended every temptation, that means the tree, he departed from him, from Jesus, until an opportune time. That means he only left Jesus alone for a while. He finds another opportunity. So likewise, we are no special. We overcome and we must keep overcoming. The devil may test you, tempt you once, didn't make it, but the devil will come back again. So it's not like, wow, I overcome enough. No, you must keep overcoming. And before we leave this section, I want to point out to you uh, why did Jesus go through all this temptation? Number one, to reveal to us who is he. So you look at Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. 
Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. Inasmuch that as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shed in the same. That through death, that means Jesus came in the flesh and blood like us, just like we are. That through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. And who has the power? That is the devil. Verse 15. And release those who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So those who do not know God for, forever, they are always in this bondage. Fear of death. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Who are the seed of Abraham? We all are the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation. That means to take the place of, to take the place of a sacrifice for the sins of the people. So, through all these things, he had to be made like his brethren. So he came in the flesh and blood like us. And, that he might be a merciful and faithful. Means if you have run the 10 miles with me, uh, you will know how tiring it is. You follow me? Uh? If you only see me at the finishing line, they say, wow, how was the run? Uh? Very tiring. Oh, oh, oh really? Uh, oh, take a rest, take a break. You don't understand how tired it is. You try a marathon. But if I run the marathon with you, uh, I know exactly how it feels. Even though I'm the Olympic champion, but I, I go through with you, I know how it feels. And Jesus need not, but he went through so that he can be a merciful and faithful high priest pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. So that he knows what kind of temptation and we know what kind of temptation and he passed it. So we must also pass the test. For in that he himself had suffered being tempted Tempted, right? We just studied Matthew chapter 4. He suffered being tempted. He is able to aid, to help those who are tempted, not who were tempted. Who are tempted. We are still being tempted as long as we are in this body. So this is to reveal to us who he is. He is the merciful and faithful high priest. And the next thing is to relate to us as we are. So still in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14. So we know he is the faithful, faith, merciful high priest. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who had passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. That means what? Our confession that he is the Son of God and God raised him from the dead. That means our faith in Him. When you accepted Christ, you repented, you made a confession, right? So hold fast to that, to that. Don't give up. Don't give up, Jesus. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are. What were the all points that He was tested as we are being tested? Last of the flesh, the pride of life, and the last of the eye. All points he was tested, and so as we are, we are also tested, yet without sin. That means what? Jesus passed the test. Because if he did not, he meant he disobeyed. He ate the, he turned the stone into bread. Or he jumped down. Or he bowed down to the devil. But yet without sin. He passed the test. So, Knowing that our high priest did that, so what must we do? Let us therefore come boldly. Don't no scare, scare. Just come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace. Because we read just now, he is the merciful yeah, and faithful high priest. Obtain mercy and find grace to help when? In time. For the Old Testament Jews, they cannot go before the throne of grace. Everything got to go through the priest and so on. But we now 
can because the curtain has been torn and we can now go before the throne of grace. And how wonderful that is. What a privilege that is. Knowing that the one whom we worship has passed all the tests and we in him, as we are tested at all points, we will likewise be without sin. Okay? So, that is chapter 4, verse 1 to 11. You want a break? Or, okay, let's take a break. <laughs>